with spring virtually around the corner, many RVers are or should be thinking about some destination plans for this year. If you plan on visiting New England, in particular the Cape Cod area, Michelle Fontaine shows us the Bayview Campground, easy to get to just off the Cape Cod Bridge and close to a lot of attractions. It's the perfect place to spend a few days in the Upper Cape. Then, with so many RVers looking at installing a solar system, the question is, can I do the install myself? This week, Jeff Johnston shows us exactly what's involved as he takes us through the installation of a GoPower solar kit on his own Palomino camper. Later, everyone knows how a bee sting can affect humans in various ways, from just an annoyance to an all-out negative reaction or medical emergency. Well, guess what? Your pets can have the same reaction, and knowing what to do is important. This week on Paws on Board, Dr. Fitz explains the various ways a bee sting can affect your pet and what you should do in case it does happen. These stories and more on this week's RVing Today. Closed and Spanish captioning where available is sponsored by Forest River. Follow the river. Hi, I'm here with Dave Ritchie of Bayview Campground in Bourne, Massachusetts. This is right at the beginning of the Cape, right over the, the Bourne Bridge on the other side of the canals. Mm -hmm. We're right off of Route 28, which is a major highway that mm -hmm. uh, goes down to Falmouth. My father-in-law, Gardner S. Nightingale, um, he was a police officer here in the town of Bourne. And the Second World War broke out, and any patriotic young man at the time, they, he enlisted to, in the Army. But he always knew he wanted to do something, so while he was overseas, he would send money back to his mom, and he would ask her to buy little parcels of land. By that time, he had purchased up to 90 acres, 98 acres of land here on the Cape, this, this section here. Because this area here had a lot of natural uh, vegetation, apples, peaches, pears. Mm -hmm. So he started the fruit stand right here at the front. 66, he started the campground, but before that, he uh, had the fruit stand that he tried. Mm -hmm. There was a friend of his uh, um, out in Maple Park over in Wareham, uh, Paul Tusi and Paul owned a small campground there, and he said, well, you're on this side of the canal, I'm on that side of the canal, why don't you try starting a campground? Um, their first night that they opened, there were 30 sites, and he made it all with that little machete. How uh, many sites are there now, David? Um, now there's 468 sites. It's middle of July, you're almost booked, and yes. yet we've been here two nights already, and there's a quiet peacefulness. Oh, um, my father-in-law and mother-in-law, they geared the campground right from the get-go, family camping. Mm -hmm. And you can see it right on our main sign and all our advertisement it is family camping. Uh, people that come camping, especially with kids, uh, they come from the suburbs, mm -hmm. city, Boston, whichever it may be, and we love it here because we let our kids go. Yeah. We just say go. We, uh, we have uh, one mile, 1.7 miles of chain link fence all the way at the camp around the campground. The only way in and out is that front gate. Good. So the kids are locked in. So the parents know this and it's the best time because they can now let their kids be kids. I've given a, a lot of thought in the swimming pools as far as what to put into it. This one here is a jumping pool, it's eight feet deep. It also has a very small area, one foot for the little ones. This pool here only goes to about four feet high because that's for the mid-sized kids. Okay. So they're not the whole pool, so they can have the whole pool to have fun in. They're still touching the bottom. Um, this one here is for recreation. We have volleyball and basketball. The lower pool one was geared more for what we call our seasonals. They are the people who stay here year round or for the full season from May 1st to October 15th. Mm -hmm. And they kind of gravitate toward that one down there because we have adult entertainment down there. There's a singer, she'll come down and she'll have a sing along with them. Uh, the main building here uh, is the, one of the original buildings of the grounds. And we added to it as we expanded. Um, the ice cream parlor was, we wanted something a little different and ice cream was perfect. So we gave it the 1950s look of a old fashioned uh, ice cream parlor. The new machines as they come along and such, uh, I want every kid who goes in there to walk out with something. It's, it's no longer just to make money or for entertainment. I want the kids to have a good time just as much as the adults do. Another story you brought up that I think very interesting. There are no bugs here. Ah, yes. <laughs> How come there are no bugs here? Uh, my daughter, when she was going to college, she also did some uh, agricultural um, studies. 
And what we found was that uh, bugs, mosquitoes, whatever, lay their larvae in the leaves in the woods. The dead leaves on the ground. On the ground. They, they try to get them under the leaves because it's moist and it, it helps with the larvae to hatch when the rain and such comes out. Uh, but I just said, well, let's just rake everything. And that's what we did. We raked the sites between the sites, the embankments. The main part of the grounds, which is approximately 60 acres, uh, is completely raked from fence to fence. And it seemed after the years, where we eliminate the bugs. And, though, and your sites mm -hmm. are quite large too. We didn't know it at the time when Gardner and I were expanding the grounds. We just went by a, a plain footprint of 50 by 50. Mm -hmm. 50 feet deep, 50 foot wide. And some, uh, we went by the, uh, um, the topo or the configuration of the land. If you notice, the grounds is in different tiers. So we used the topography of the land and we developed it in different tiers and we went by the land. So if you know some of the, the roads are very windy and turn, we just went with the land. Uh, we planted over uh, 30,000 uh, little seedlings throughout the campground. We just kept planting these little seedlings all over trying to replenish. Um, some of the sites you'll see there's a big tree right in the middle of it. We tried to accommodate that old tree mm -hmm. in the middle instead of just taking it down and making room for bigger rigs. We try to accommodate. How many staff members do you have? Uh, we have 50 during the summertime and then we have seven full-timers of course summer and winter. Mm -hmm. From here you can go deeper into the Cape so there's a lot of things families can go off and do. Hour from Boston, mm -hmm. we're an hour from Providence, Rhode Island and we're an hour from P-Town. Mm -hmm. We just keep going. Well, thank, thank you very you. much. I appreciate that. When Bedford launched Aquacam it didn't take long before it became the number one selling holding tank treatment for over 50 years. Until now. Meet Aquamax, Thetford's new generation of holding tank products that works even better and are also campground friendly and environmentally safe. Looks like a new number one is taking over. For more information, visit Thetford.com. Want more RVing today? Then visit RVingToday.tv. Besides our weekly show and extended segments, you'll find additional stories and videos along with insightful information on what's new and what's happening around the world in RVing. From luxury RVs to unique camper vans and from RVing with pets to RVing with kids, you'll find it all and more in RVingToday.tv. Dry camping or boondocking is really popular these days among our RVing fraternity. And because of that, the popularity of solar charging systems for your batteries is also gaining. Uh, when you're out there boondocking, you don't have any hookups. A solar system keeps your battery up to snuff and you don't run out of power. We're gonna tackle a GoPower Solar Elite charging system installation on this Palomino truck camper. It's a fairly small camper. There's not a lot of room inside. There's plenty of room on the roof. It includes two 190 watt solar panels for a total of 380 watts, which is a lot of power. And the system also includes this GoPower 2000 watt inverter, which also has a 100 amp charger built in. So we're gonna to have to find a spot to put this inside. We think we've got it figured out. We're gonna give it a shot and find out. Now the kit, in this case, includes just about everything you need Oh, you've got your large diameter cables for running the battery power to the converter inverter and the inverter control panel that mounts in the cabinet. This is the solar charge controller which regulates the voltage coming from the, uh, the solar panels to charge the battery. This is in the kit. There's just about all the other wiring, hardware, everything else that you need to do this installation. GoPower advertises this as a set that can be installed by a user at home. Well, we are at a user's home, and other than for the fact that we've got a wonderful rainy day here in Indiana, we're hoping that the rain stops long enough for us to get the work done up on the rooftop. And we're also gonna go inside first and see about getting this uh, converter mounted and modified as needed. We did a survey of the interior here, and there's really only one reasonable location, and this may even not be reasonable, but we're gonna give it a try anyway, where the inverter will fit. And that is uh, the cabinet that I'm sitting on is the cabinet that has the battery on one side, the water uh, tank on the other, and some various miscellaneous wiring inside. Now, the, you know, so the inverter cannot fit in there. However, down here on the floor, underneath where the, uh, where the table sits, 
it's kind of a little storage area. And we don't need this, uh, all this storage area for storage. So the plan is we're going to remove this little cabinet piece from the rig and modify it so that the, the inverter fits in this far corner of the cabinet. And then take the carpeted top, move it up to the top of the converter or the inverter. And then that gives the inverter access through this panel to the, uh, uh, to the wiring on the inside near the battery. So down here for the inverter module, the all 39 or so pounds of it, we cut this piece of plywood that we had laying around, cut it to shape, screwed it down to the actual structure so we have something good and firm for the, uh, for the inverter not to slide around or damage anything. We framed a simple plywood box covered in paneling to match the camper interior to house the inverter. We think the finished inverter box installation looks pretty good in the camper here. We've got ventilation holes on the sides to allow cooling for the inverter. can lift up the lid if we need to allow even more air circulation for more cooling. Two dedicated plugs on the front powered strictly by the inverter for uh, video battery charging and so on. And uh, this provides a really great additional step going from the floor up here to the cab over bunk. Now we also have, we still have access to the storage down underneath here for long skinny things. And this is the auxiliary breaker panel for the two circuits that come out of the uh, inverter. The AM Solar guys did a really good job on the wiring in the compartment. The GoPower solar charge controller mounts very nicely on the frame that we built for the surface of the, of the wiring cabinet here. Uh, we put it on the outside frame just to avoid having to recess it inside and get any more complications inside the box here. The holes drilled around the edge provide a little air circulation to keep it cooled. We think the installation works very nicely. Now we're back in Oregon. The weather is great. We're headed up to the roof to tackle the solar panels. Forest River, we not only build great RVs, we build award-winning RVs. Check out our complete product line at forestriverinc.com. Forest River, begin the journey. At Norcole, we realize that some of your favorite RV destinations are off the grid. And Norcal refrigerators are uniquely designed with that RV experience in mind. We call it Freedom Unplugged. To learn more about our Norcal RV refrigerator line or to find a dealer near you, visit our website at norcal.com. One of the more challenging aspects of solar panel installation can be finding space on the roof for the panels. There's so many appliances and gadgets up here nowadays that some of them are pretty crowded, but we only have the three vent covers and the factory stock OEM solar panel to work around. And of course, the best thing to use is the cardboard box that the solar panels come in. This is uh, a little easier than wrangling the panels up here. We have room away from the vent cover just short of the uh, joiner, the, the junction box here for routing the power down inside the vehicle. And we've got an equal amount of room there on the other side of the, the camper. Looks like it'll work out great. On to step two. First up is installing the mounting feet on the panels. We 
bring the panel up here. Kind of lay it down face down at first. Got the cables loose. So we carefully turn it over without dragging any of the uh, little mounting tabs on the rubber roof. There we go. Looks like eh, right around six inches. Right around six inches, close counts. I'm using a grease pencil, make a little mark on the roof where our front two mounting tabs will be. Because when we turn the panel over again and install it, there's gonna be sealant on the bottom. So we wanna just install it, set it down, and not move it all over the roof with the sealant on it. From here, we turn the panel back over and ready to clean the surface and finish the install. Self-leveling sealant and adhesive helps prevent leaks around the mounts. Particularly heavy, but okay, I've got mine in position. That's good, yeah, all right. Just carefully let them down on the back there. And cool. This is so much easier with two people. God, I was dreading doing this at home. This is really a lot easier like this with two people. Okay, you're on there? I'm good. Okay. Just hold it a second, it's gonna to wanna to, it's gonna to wanna to slide around a little. Technically you probably shouldn't need to pre-drill these holes, but I always pre-drill holes a little bit anyway. Finally, just put a glob of the glue, the goo, the sealant right on the screw heads. Just to make sure. Final step in the process is finishing up the rooftop wiring. Now we started with two Y connectors that allow you to connect two solar panels into one input for the input box here. Now the passenger side panel was a little bit too far away from the junction box. So we picked up these two 18 inch extensions for the 12 volt input. We'll kind of loop them around here. Yeah, we can fasten this down. The idea behind these little tie downs, of course, is because you don't want to have the cables rattling around on the roof and putting stress on the connectors, or on the panels or the connections while the whole time you're driving down the road. Okay, what the hell is this? This cable here and this short one are the cables from the uh, the original OEM panel that was installed, but we kind of bypassed that one in favor of the Go Power panels. So we'll also fasten this down just to keep it in place in case someday we want to tap it into the whole system. But we've got enough amperage going with the Go Power panels that I don't think we're going to need to use the original panel as well. The sealant not only helps to secure the pad to the roof, like you know, glue. It's kind of an adhesive as well, really good adhesive in fact. It also, uh, you put a little glob on top, and it helps keep the wire from rattling around in the zip tie, which is kind of neat. Well now you've seen how we installed this GoPower solar charging system on our Palomino truck camper. It's a little bit of a job, there's no lying about that, but any enthusiast who enjoys tools and knows a little bit about working with this sort of thing can do the job on your own RV. Want more RVing today? Then visit RVingToday.tv. Besides our weekly show and extended segments, you'll find additional stories and videos along with insightful information on what's new and what's happening around the world in RVing. From luxury RVs to unique camper vans, and from RVing with pets to RVing with kids, you'll find it all and more in RVingToday.tv. 
When Thetford launched AquaChem, it didn't take long before it became the number one selling holding tank treatment for over 50 years. Until now. Meet Aquamax, Thetford's new generation of holding tank products that works even better and are also campground friendly and environmentally safe. Looks like a new number one is taking over. For more information, visit Thetford.com. Welcome to RVing Today's Paws on Board. I'm Dr. Fitz. And this is Georgie. Did you know that dogs can be allergic to bee stings? I know. That's right. Just like with some people, some dogs can be extremely sensitive to bee stings. Dogs can either be stung by a bee somewhere on their body or be stung after they attempt to eat the bee. Most dogs will be mildly itchy and slightly sore in the location where they were stung. However, if your dog was stung, you should monitor them for about the next several hours to ensure that they do not have an allergic reaction. Dogs may develop swelling at the site of the sting. They may also develop hives, which in short-haired dogs look like small bumps under the skin. In long-haired dogs, you may be able to feel them when you pet your dog. Some pets will get extremely itchy as well. A small proportion of dogs will progress and have more severe reactions to a sting, including swelling of the face and neck, vomiting, diarrhea, and even difficulty breathing. These signs indicate a severe allergic reaction and your pet should be taken to a veterinarian immediately. Anaphylaxis, or an allergic reaction, in dogs is treated similarly to a reaction in people. If you're traveling or know that your dog is allergic to bee stings, what should you do to try to prevent a reaction? In a season one episode of Paws on Board, I outlined some items that you should have in a pet first aid kit. One of these items was Benadryl. Benadryl is an antihistamine and can help to reduce the severity of allergic reactions. If your pet is stung by a bee while on the road, or it starts to show some mild signs of a reaction, such as itchiness, give them some Benadryl. This can help to prevent the reaction from getting worse or buy you some time so you can get your pet to a veterinarian for further treatment. Benadryl is in no way a replacement for veterinary care if your pet has severe allergic reactions. Prior to travel, contact your vet for the proper dosing of Benadryl for your dog. Several other insects that can cause skin reactions in dogs include mosquitoes and black flies. Most dogs have minimal reaction to mosquito bites, but some may become itchy or develop hives. If this occurs, again, it's always a good idea to have the Benadryl on hand. Black flies can be a seasonal problem in some parts of the country, and their bites can cause some pretty dramatic looking welts. Often, dogs will be brought into the clinic for these circular red spots that they have on their belly and groin that may or may not be itchy. Generally, these are caused by black flies that bite your dog from underneath. These spots will usually go away on their own, but if they don't, you can apply a thin layer of a triple antibiotic ointment to treat the mild skin infection. An important note, occasionally these black fly bites can appear target-like and may be confused with a tick bite. The classic target lesion of Lyme disease in people is actually rarely seen in dogs. Although the red spot you may see could be from a tick bite, the redness is usually due to irritation and a mild bacterial infection but it's always a good idea to have your pet on tick prevention to reduce the likelihood of any diseases from ticks. Although there are preventative products on the market, many bug bites and stings are difficult to prevent. But as an owner, you can be prepared to deal with the possible reactions your dog might have and feel comfortable when you're on the road. For more information about traveling safely with your pets, visit rvingtoday.tv. Tune in next time for more pet health information. I'm Dr. Fitz. This is Georgie. Thanks for watching Paws on Board. For additional information on any of the stories or products seen on this week's show, visit our website at rvingtoday.tv. Don't forget, you can also watch RVing Today on Roku, Amazon Fire, Vimeo, YouTube, or any of our station streaming services. This has been another fun production. If you're into RVing or just appreciate vintage vehicles, be sure to set your GPS for the RV MH Hall of Fame in Elkhart, Indiana. This museum houses the largest collection of vintage RVs and trailers dating as far back as 1916.
more information, visit their website at rvmhhalloffame.org.